Good morning, everyone. Um, it's truly an honor to be able to come here today and tell you the story of a new treatment for breast cancer. Thank you to my Roche colleagues who've, um, from Greece who've invited me along. Um, my name is Charlotte Colthorpe. As mentioned, I'm the international medical leader for Cadsila, which is also known as Trastuzumab Mtansin, and for short, TDM1. And I want to take you through the journey of the clinical development of this agent. It's an agent that for a long time has been, or a mode of action for a long time that many have wished for. And it's actually the dedication of obviously not only Roche Genentech, but more importantly, the investigators and the patients that have been involved in our clinical trials that have brought this wish and desire, vision, to be able to be an approved medicine in the EMA and in other countries around the world. Actually, over 100 years ago, Paul Elric, who is a German um, physician, bridged the gap between chemistry, biology, and medicine. He named, um, def well, defined chemotherapy as the use of chemicals to tr treat disease. And he actually focused on the fact that what we needed to do was to provide targeted delivery. We must learn how to aim chemically, he said in 1897. I'm going to take you through some background to breast cancer so we can all be on the same page. Some of this you, you might already know. Um, and then I'll take you through the development and the future perspectives. So some, in the, some of you in the room will be, have been involved in treating patients with breast cancer, involved in clinical trials in breast cancer, but I'm sure all of you in this room have actually been touched by people who've suffered or um, fought the battle against breast cancer. It's a huge burden across the world. 1.4 million women across the globe are diagnosed each year with breast cancer. In Greece, it's around 6,000 patients. And it's actually the leading cause of death um, in women worldwide. More than 400,000 women die from the disease each year. And in Greece, it's estimated to be around 1,100 women per year die of the disease. So it's a huge burden. Around 20% of patients have um, a subtype called HER2-positive breast cancer. It's where a HER2 protein on the cell surface is overexpressed in HER2-positive breast cancer. Normal cells have HER2-positive proteins on the cell surface, but as you can see from this picture here, cancer cells that are overexpressing HER2 will have many, many more HER2 um, proteins and receptors. It's been shown that patients with HER2-positive breast cancer have a negative, it's a negative prognostic factor. Their disease is generally more aggressive. It's less responsive to chemotherapy and hormonal agents. And essentially, it's associated with a poor prognosis and patients who are increased at risk of disease progression. This gene and the subsequent protein was discovered back in the early 80s where the gene was identified, it was cloned, and it was seen that it was overexpressed in breast cancer tumors. Late 1980s, it was discovered that it was, the, it was associated with a negative um, prognostic um, aggressive phenotype cancer. And the actual antibody was developed against this HER2 type breast cancer. It was initially a monoclonal antibody, but it was from a mouse origin, which inherently led to risks of immune responses when given clinically. So a humanized version of this antibody was developed in the early 90s, which um, is trastuzumab, also known as Herceptin. And early 90s, Trastuzumab was put into the clinical trial setting. Clinical trials began. In general, with breast cancer, we, look, we start clinical trial in the later, more advanced, uh, more medical need area. And 
we saw some great results. We saw that trastuzumab significantly prolonged survival in this first-line metastatic breast cancer setting. It's difficult to show an improvement of overall survival in the metastatic setting because basically we're having subsequent treatments that are obviously out of the control of the study. This is therefore a landmark that we managed to produce um, this overall survival benefit of around nearly five months when we added trastuzumab on top of chemotherapy, as you can see from this Kaplan-Meier curve. So this led to an approval of trastuzumab in the late 90s for metastatic breast cancer based on two studies looking at two different combinations, um, one with docetaxel and one with paclitaxel. In parallel, though, the trastuzumab was also being explored in the early breast cancer setting. This setting is curative, can be curative, and this led to a, a study called HERA that was presented at one of the large oncology congresses in 2005. And actually, the data from this um, caused a standing ovation in the congress hall which was unprecedented. It led then to an EMA and US approval and now is approved in many, many countries across the world. Towards the, a few years later, we had um, a new anti-HER2 agent join the anti-HER2 treatment landscape. This was called lapatinib, and lapatinib is a small molecule um, that is combined with chemotherapy again and is approved in metastatic breast cancer also. So basically, trastuzumab has revolutionized the treatment of HER2-positive breast cancer from identifying a gene to finding a target, um, a targeted therapy, and actually demonstrating that we had overall survival. We extended patients' lives with the use of this agent. Additional agents have also come along that can also provide a benefit um, to, to these patients. However, around half of the women that are given first-line trastuzumab, actually their disease does still progress. The further treatment options that are available, as I mentioned, lapatinib, cape, cytobine, are useful, have been shown to be beneficial in clinical trials, although sometimes their toxicity uh, is limiting their use. Therefore, further effective treatment options are required for this very aggressive um, um, breast cancer disease. And this is what I wanted to talk to you to, about today. The development of a group of drugs called antibody drug conjugates, which trastuzumab is one of them. So what is an antibody drug conjugate? It's actually a drug, a highly potent drug, attached to an antibody. Quite simple. Very simple to say, but as you can imagine, very, sim very, very difficult to develop. But the general idea is that the antibody will take the potent chemotherapy um, directly to the tumor cell, and the, 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 the drug and the antibody will be um, brought into the cell, the cytotoxic drug will be released, and will kill the tumor cell. Simple to say. The benefit of this is that we can increase the drug delivery directly to the cells that need the chemo the, 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 we want to get the chemotherapy to. We also, by taking it directly to the tumor cell, can reduce the normal exposure, or the normal tissue exposure to the harmful effects of chemotherapy. It's all about improving the therapeutic window. However, processing an antibody drug conjugate can lead to unwanted toxicity. So in this cartoon, I've basically highlighted that link of failure can obviously lead to free drug in the circulation, where therefore it could get to the healthy tissues and, become, and, and cause toxicity. The other problem is that we actually need to ensure that that chemotherapy is getting directly to the cells we want to get to. So we need to have an antibody that is very specific for our target, for it to be a success. 
So let me introduce to you TDM1, Trastuzumab m tansine The big blobby pink thing is the Trastuzumab molecule, a monoclonal antibody. Attached to that is the chemotherapy agent, cytotoxic agent, DM1. DM1 is a derivative of mitansine, and mitansine was actually tested in clinical trials in the, in the 70s. It was very effective, but it was hampered by significant toxicity. Now, the magic in this molecule is the fact that we can stably link the cytotoxic drug to the trastuzumab. And this has been um, a, 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 the most difficult part of developing this agent. Five different linkers were tried, and eventually one was discovered that would hold the cytotoxic drug onto the trastuzumab before, until it got to the cell service and be brought into the cell in order to kill the cell. I've just got a little cartoon here that I just wanted to show you to show you what we have. We have the molecule and the HER2 receptor entering the cell there. Inside the cell, we have lysosomes breaking down and releasing the DM1. And the DM1 um, is a potent antimicrotrubial um, polymerization inhibitor. The DM1 attacks that and therefore the cell is killed. What did we see in preclinical trials, though? Well, this was the time point where our scientists at Genentech became very excited. They looked at using, in a, in a um, preclinical model, trastuzumab, seen here in the orange. And you can see in here that there initially was some response. We've got mean tumor volume on the left against days on the x-axis. You can see in the first three weeks, we had a response seen in this model with trastuzumab with repeated dosing. However, in the blue line, you can see that when TDM1 was given just one single dose, we managed to maintain or reduce the tumor volume significantly and managed to maintain that up to 130 days. This was very exciting for our preclinical team, and this meant that we moved the, the drug into the clinical setting. So one of the first studies, we needed to find what was the dose. What dose did we need to move forward with? It was a pretty aggressive phase one dose-finding study where we increased in successive cohorts. We doubled the dose of trastuzumab trust tansine. We didn't see any DLT in the up to 4.8 milligrams per kilogram. However, at 4.8 milligrams per kilogram, we found a dose-limiting toxicity of thrombocytopenia. That meant that we moved the maximum tolerated dose was identified as 3.6 milligram per kilogram every three weeks. And that was moved into proof-of-concept studies. Two studies were performed around 200 patients in all. And as I mentioned before, in the breast cancer setting, we start um, our clinical trial development program. It tends to be in the later lines of treatment where there is more a me medical need. So these patients had actually received quite a number of previous treatments before entering the study. We saw response rates between the two studies, they were, they were around about the same, 33 to 41%. And actually, this is pretty similar to the response rates we've seen in the treatment of this particular time, fairly pretreated patients. So this looked like we actually had a dose. We knew that we had an efficacy that was similar to what we had. We knew we had an agent that potentially could maybe stop the harmful effects that we've seen from traditional chemotherapy. We then wanted to know whether we could show that it was better than what was already out there, what the standard of care was. So there were two randomized control trials set up. The first one, which I'll refer to as the 4450 study, was a hypothesis generating study. We wanted to see if TDM1 could perform 
better than the standard of care in the first line metastatic setting, so the untreated metastatic setting of trastuzumab and chemotherapy. And the second study, called Amelia, was a study set up to gain registration. It was a phase three study. So looking at the initial study, the 4450 study, I mentioned it was 137 patients, but they were treated in the first line setting. So it was a one-to-one -one randomization with the standard of care versus TDM1. It was treatment until the progression. The primary endpoints were progression-free survival, a common primary endpoint used in oncology research. Secondary endpoints included overall survival, quality of life, um, and response rates. It was an open-label study, and it was an international study, um, and had around um, 30 sites. In 2011, the data was presented at one of in the European Congress, and it created, I have to say, an enormous excitement in the medical community. We saw here that we could show a five-month improvement in progression-free survival, a median progression-free survival. Our control arm here in the blue, the trastuzumab-based treatment, gave a progression-free survival number of 9.2 months. And our trastuzumab, emtansine, showed 14.2 months progression-free survival. This is pretty impressive in this, this um, disease. Not only did we have efficacy, though, when we looked at the grade 3 and above adverse events, we could see that in the trastuzumab arm, we had 90 grade 3 and above events. But in the TDN1 arm, we could see that we nearly half that, and we had 46 events. This was 46% of patients received, having a grade 3 and above. This, this, was, this was showing us that we had not only a targeted agent that could kill the cancer cells, but we were managing to keep the cytotoxic associated with the antibody until it reached the tumor cells. And also, because of the improved safety profile, we could see that our adverse events causing discontinuation were very um, small number of patients. 7.2% of patients um, were discontinuing treatment in the TDM1 arm versus nearly 30% in the control arm. So there was great excitement, and the anticipation of our Amelia Phase 3 data um, was, was, was quite high. We have here, this is our Phase 3 study, where we looked at the next line of treatment. So patients who'd received first-line treatment in metastatic disease, we looked into the second line. Patients who'd already been on trastuzumab, could we overcome potentially trastuzumab resistance in this patient population? We had 991 patients in this study, and we compared TDM1 versus the standard approved care, lapatinib capecitabine, again treated to progression. The primary endpoints of this is it was a registrational study. We had an independent review of the progression-free survival, and also from a regulatory point of view, overall survival benefit is the gold standard. In addition to, to reimbursement, overall survival is what we all aim for. So this data was presented in 20, um, 2012. And we showed, again, the same kind of efficacy benefit here, 50% improvement in progression-free survival with TDM1 compared to the standard of care. So in the, T in the lapatinib cape cytobine arm, the median number of months of progression-free interval was 6.4 versus 9.6 in the TDM1 arm. We actually, three months later, managed to show the overall survival confirmation, where we saw that we could give patients median increase in survival of around five months. A difficult thing, as I mentioned before, to show in a metastatic breast cancer setting. And did we see the same safety profile? 
Here you can see that all grade AEs were around the same between the TDM1 arm and the lapatinib capecitabine arm. But if you look at the grade 3 and above AEs, you have 40% in the TDM1 arm and 56, well, nearly 57% in the lapatinib capecitabine arm. The type of AEs that are associated with chemotherapy. We also had less um, AEs leading to treatment discontinuation and less AEs um, leading to death. So what does this mean for the patients? In our trial, we also used um, a validated tool, FACT-B, Patient um, Reported Outcome Tool. And we saw that for patients also, they felt that TDM1 delayed the time to them getting the symptoms of either adverse events or progression. And you can see here that the median time to symptom progression as assessed by the patients was 7.1 months in the TDM1 arm versus 4.6 in the lapatinib capecitabine arm. So following this data, it led to three things, three major things. The decision was made at Roche to file TDM1, and I'm very pleased to say that in the US, we received approval February last year, and in the EMA, we received um, approval at the end of last year. And we're hoping that, um, um, according to our, my Greek colleagues, that TDM1 will be available and hopefully approved for reimbursement towards the end of this year. We also had a relatively small exposure of patients with, our, with, with TDM1. So we opened a global safety study to explore further the, the safety profile of TDM1 and to also collect the sort of the long-term follow-up of safety. This allowed um, patients to be able to access um, the medication and the demand for this study was unbelievable, I have to say. It surpassed anything that we thought. And if you're planning trials, we always assume we will have to need um, a huge amount of motivation to keep investigators um, and, and patients um, recruited into the study. This surpassed, as I said, all expectations. We um, have several patients being able to access TDM1 via Camilla in Greece as well, and I'm pleased to say that we had 31 patients join this study from Greece. At the same time, we opened um, a global compassionate use program. This is something that actually Roche has, has not in the historically done opening compassionate use. However, the, the excitement about this, this agent and the fact that it was innovative, new, met um, the requirements of a disease that needed further treatment options, we opened this compassionate use program to allow patients who had tried all other standard options to be able to receive TDM1. This again was, we had over 600 patients join this compassionate use program. And I have to say, as um, a, a, a medical leader in, in a pharmaceutical company, we reviewed all of those compassionate use cases. And it is very moving to see the, the patient need, the family need of those cases and I'm pleased to say that nearly 600 patients received TDM1 via that, that program. 15 of them were in Greece. So what's the future for TDM1? We actually will, uh, we've got several ongoing studies. Um, we want to move into earlier lines um, of HER2 breast cancer to provide the benefits of TDM1, not only into the earlier metastatic setting, but also into the early breast cancer setting. So we have Marianne, which Greece is involved in. We have the HER2 positive early breast cancer study, Catherine. Greece is also, I'm very pleased to say, is involved in there. And then HER2 is also expressed on gastric cancer um, cells. And therefore, we um, also have a study called Gatsby looking at that with TDM1. The ultimate aim would be to be able to provide patients who are diagnosed in the early breast cancer um, setting a traditional chemo-free regime. There is various um, limitations from a regulatory pathway that will um, 
makes it somewhat difficult, but ultimately this is something that we know m the medical community is very keen to explore. Can we get away with treating these, can we get away with, with treating patients with this aggressive form of breast cancer without giving them the chemotherapy and the side effects that are associated with chemotherapy? We're not there yet, we're looking into it, but that's just to give you a kind of glimpse into the future. From a regulatory standpoint, things are moving as well. Um, recently, we had one of our um, other agents approve pertuzumab, uh, approved for early breast cancer using a surrogate marker. So PCR, which is um, pathological complete response, assessed after surgery in early breast cancer, was approved, was an approval basis to get an early breast cancer drug um, in the US. This is a real step forward. We've, we can see that the regulators are moving um, into trying to ensure that we can uh, have smaller studies to be able to get to the endpoints that will require approval. So I just wanted to go back to Paul Ehrlich's um, vision that he had to, uh, 100 years ago in, 19, in 1897. We've come a long way. In the 70s, we had our metancine, the, the um, parent compound of DM1 identified. Monoclonal antibodies came along in the 80s, and we identified the HER2 protein. We had trastuzumab coming in clinical trials in the 80s and 90s. We advanced our antibody drug conjugate science to enable the linker to remain stable. And we tested several molecules, and we've come up with something that we, we have seen in clinical trials and also been approved by regulators to be an efficacious and, and a better safety profile drug. And we have our pivotal Amelia study allowing approval in 2012. I'd like to thank you very much for listening. Um, it's been a great honor to, to be able to present this story to you. And I will join the panel later to take questions. Thank you.